Hello people who like old machine tools. This is my 10 E, and this is a series of a couple of videos on how I powered it. The drive consists of a motor in the bottom with a two-speed gearbox on the front of the motor that then belt drives the spindle. When I got mine, the two speed sorry, the DC motor had been cut off from the two-speed gearbox and the gearbox was with the lathe but no motor. This photo shows another 10 EE that I had a few years ago. The original arrangement with the gearbox that kind of forms, you can see the pieces that uh, extend back and form the front end of uh, the DC motor. What I, what I decided to do was to take a five horsepower AC motor, three phase, and adapt it to the original two speed gearbox so I'd have a back gear. The plan is to remove the front uh, housing of the motor and make a, a new uh, piece that becomes both the back of the two-speed gearbox and the front of the motor and then use the motor shaft the rotor shaft as one of the internal shafts in the in the gearbox the idea is pretty simple but there's a lot of carefully fit pieces into this so i'll just quickly run through how i did it the back of the gearbox has two pins as you can see in the picture above and we've got a very accurately create these in a mating piece of aluminum. There's also the mounting bolt clearance hole locations, but uh, caliper work is good enough for that. My first thought was to locate the three holes using the surface plate, uh, surface gauge, and gauge box. Clamp the part to a tool maker's box so you can index at 90 degrees, find all the XY coordinates. Then with indicator, gauge blocks, and surface gauge, you can get the exact location. It works but it's tedious and there's a better way. On a nice big slab of aluminum, I drilled and tapped holes for maker's buttons at the locations I'd already figured out using the, uh, the surface plate and the indicator. You don't worry about getting tool maker's buttons to the exact location, you get them approximate at this point, and then I use gauge blocks to set the exact spacing of the tool maker's buttons. First, I develop a stack of gauge blocks that fit perfectly between the existing pins on the back of the gearbox. I know there's lots of chance for accumulated air with such a big stack, but I'm using high-end gauge blocks and it's the best approach I had, and it worked. Moving over to the aluminum piece, loosen one of the tool maker's buttons and put the gauge block, the same gauge block stack in between and snug them up. Indicate each button and you're ready to start boring. After drilling a pilot hole, I used a boring head to get the final dimensions for the pins. This way, I'm making the hole exactly where I lined up from indicating on the, uh, the tool maker's button. So the two holes should be spaced as accurately as my gauge block stack was, which uh, was pretty good and good enough. And things just fit beautifully together. It's tricky to get this part made so that it fits to these pins properly, and I thought about trying to remove the pins. I could not figure out a way to do so and they're hardened and I just didn't want to mess up that gearbox. So this is the, uh, while a bit tedious, this is the route that I took. The aluminum plate gets clamped to the mill table and the gearbox gets installed on it with the pins. Then I indicated the bore in the gearbox for the next hole. I drilled and finally used a boring head. The next step, I need to bore a uh, I put a bore into the aluminum to fit the bearing for the front of the motor and in my opinion uh, accurate fits for rolling element bearings are among the most demanding work we do in the home shop so I wanted to do this in the lathe but uh, the piece wouldn't fit in the lathe until I knocked off the corners on the other side of the aluminum piece I have to mimic the front end of the motor so I carefully measured it set the work up in the fore jaw and bored away. Uh, note the proud area in the middle. This is turned so that it fits perfectly in the motor housing so that I get great concentricity with the motor housing and the rotor shaft. Very careful work and measurement done to get the right bearing fit. I use a tense digital indicator clamped onto the cross slide to give myself the best chance of being able to get these bores accurate. The mounting hole locations on the uh, motor are easily done with transfer screws. Then it's a simple matter of drilling clearance holes and mounting the plate on the motor housing. Going to the gearbox side, the mounting hole locations are uh, done with transfer punches. 
and we have a gearbox mounted to a motor. I'll wrap that one up now, but fret not, dear viewer. There's more excitement to come in part two of attaching a gearbox to a motor. The question often comes up, why not just use a VFD to control the speed? Well, there's a good answer for that. Machine tools are designed to cover a range of different sizes of materials, or in the case of a mill, cutter diameters, through having a broad range of speeds. You'd turn a 1 inch diameter piece of material at a different speed than you would a 6 inch diameter piece of material, for example. Because power is a function of torque and speed, uh, power essentially equals torque times speed, as you decrease the speed, you need to increase the torque to have the same power. That's what a mechanical transmission does for you, but a VFD does not. As you decrease the speed, torque stays the same, so power drops off. As a result, electronic speed control ends up being suboptimal to a mechanical transmission. As with a mechanical transmission, when you decrease the speed, the torque goes up. In many, many cases, that compromise might not be enough to matter, but it sure is on a lathe with this speed range. The design criteria were an incredible speed range of 10 RPM to 2500 RPM, amazing amounts of power over the entire speed range, and no gear connections to the spindle. The reason for the latter, very common amongst tool room quality of lathes, is so that no uh, mechanical noise can come through on the finish. And I am still using a VFD to control speed. Uh, speed settings within the high and low that the back gear provides are controlled with the VFD. So I'm not opposed to using a VFD for speed control. It's just good to go in eyes wide open, recognize its limitations. And in the case of uh, a high low back gear, the advantages of a mechanical transmission are quite strong. Uh, also, even within the range I am using it for speed control, I'm compensating by going with a much larger 5 horsepower motor.